Wedged between the vast wildernesses of the Atlantic and the Sahara, Mauritania was born of sand and wind. In order to survive there, people became nomads. It's a tough way of life, which has forged the identity of a nation. The nomadic way of life is disappearing in Mauritania. But I want to remain in the desert until the day I die. Wise men and women are still passing on their knowledge of the desert and its traditions. They are the sentinels of Mauritania. Times have changed, and nomadism has almost disappeared. Around the world, humans have become largely settled. A quarter of the 4.5 million inhabitants of the Islamic Republic of Mauritania live in the capital, Nuakshot. Nuakshot sprung out of nowhere, emerging from the sand in the 1950s to cater for French settlers. After independence in 1960, the city mushroomed thanks to the waves of drought and resultant rural exodus of thousands of nomads. The bricks and concrete which now cover the sand have not killed the nomadic soul of the Mauritanians. At the dromedary market, the roar of automobiles is drowned out by the cry of the animals. And further away, at Nuakshot's fishing port, the clamor of the sailors sounds like an invitation to travel. Amada, age 25, has no job or qualifications. He must rely on the strength in his arms and his unwavering determination to get by. To make a living here, my technique is to go to meet the fishermen and to give them a helping hand in the hope that they will give me something in return. A lot of people have quit the nomadic way of life to settle in Nwakshot. Very few people have any qualifications and there's a lot of unemployment, so people look for odd jobs. Luckily, Allah has opened my eyes and now I think I can make a living as a fisherman. I come here every day to try to learn the ropes. But I must admit, it's not easy when you don't know anyone. Someone told me about the Imrigan people. Apparently they spend their whole life at sea and are excellent fishermen. I'm curious to know how these people live, so I've decided to head north today to try to learn some of their secrets. A nation imbued with the Muslim faith and the traditions of the desert. To understand what makes Mauritanians tick, you need to look to their history and geography. Situated in both North and West Africa, Mauritania is three quarters desert and one and a half times the size of France. Its population is a cross between local animist tribes, Muslim Berbers originally from North Africa, and Beni Hassan warriors who crossed the Sahara from Arabia. Most of that population, which is 99% Muslim, now lives on the Atlantic coast. North of Nuakshot, 
Covering an area of 12,000 square kilometers, the Banc d'Aga National Park offers board and lodging to migratory birds. This sandy universe, with its wind-swept mudflats, is home to the Imragen people. This strange society, geographically and culturally cut off from the rest of Mauritania, is based entirely around the sea. The Imragen people have become hardened sand sailors and understand the caprices of the Atlantic better than anyone. As rugged as the desert they have learned to survive in, the Imregen people are known to integrate anyone willing to learn their ways into their community. The saying goes that you aren't born Imregen, you become it. That means a chance for Hamada, our apprentice fisherman from Nuakshot, to learn a new profession. About 1,500 Imregen people live in Bonk Daga, spread over eight rudimentary villages. Hamada has been told that the chief of Iwik village is an old fisherman called Nur. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine, and you? I'm fine, thank you. You're in good health? Yes, thank God. What are you doing here? Well, I'd like to learn how to be a fisherman. Do you want to learn? We can't integrate you into our society without getting to know you first. You might be a thief, or you might have problems we don't know about. No, I have no problems. I just want to learn how to fish. I was told you're a good teacher and you have a lot of experience of the sea. All right, all right. Teaching you is not a problem, but first we need to see how you fare at sea and if you're honest. I won't disappoint you. Give us a hand with the nets and then we'll see about the rest. Stand on this side and help them haul it in. That's the best way to learn. We need to finish hauling in the net. And then? After that, we load it onto the truck. Go on, make sure it's properly untangled. Without any further formalities, Hamada joins the Imragen people, anxious to prove himself under the watchful eye of old Noor. Fishing is at the center of every concern here, every activity. The Imragen people spend all their time on land repairing materials and getting the boats ready. What are you doing? We're repairing this sail. It's called a pint. Where does the cloth come from? We buy the cloth in Nuakchot, and then we bring it here. We give it to the women because they're the ones who do the sewing. Next, we're going to raise the mast. You're going to help us. Noah has set up camp a few hundred meters from the village. He lives there with his four children and his wife, who is in charge of preparing the fish. The Imregen people sell most of their fish to fish merchants from New Akshot. The rest forms the basis of their diet in this totally arid environment. Welcome, Hamada. You can sleep in my tent for a while. What do you know about fishing? I've never been allowed on board a boat. I haven't been to sea yet. All right, let's start with that. God willing, tomorrow you will set sail with Salek. He'll show you a few navigation techniques. 
is Selek the skipper? Yeah, he's in charge of the crew. He's also my nephew. If you get on okay, I'll teach you other things afterwards. God willing. Noor owns two launch sailing boats. These boats are typical of the Banque d'Agar region. He has entrusted one of his fishing boats to his nephew Salek, who is going to take Hamada under his wing today. The old man, accompanied by his eldest son, will oversee proceedings on the second launch. We need to straighten up the mast. How do you steer? Watch everything I do. It's not complicated, you'll see. These launches were brought to Mauritania by the Spanish. Then they were handed down to us, our ancestors. The sails and the shape of the hull have been adapted to our sailing needs. Look how easy they are to control. That's important for inching our way between the sandbanks. Come closer and take that. Push it towards me. Oh, that's good. Look straight ahead. Now put the tiller in the middle. Pull it towards you. Can you feel how the wind direction's changed? Now it's coming from the other side. So push it towards me. Try to follow the launch in front. Now pull it towards you if you want to go straight ahead. Look over there, those are sandbanks. You would definitely get stranded on them. You can wait hours for the tide to come back in. So those are the famous sandbanks. Straighten out the tiller. Pull it towards you. All right, wait. I'm going to need to take over here. Do you see? The channel is nicely marked out. For us, it's like a tarmac road. But if you go outside it, you've had it. Hamada, don't just sit there doing nothing. Go front and haul in the nets. Go on, haul it in. Hamada, try to pull more evenly. You're here to work. Untangle it as you pull. What sort of fish is that? That's tuna. That too. Today's been a good day. We've caught a lot of fish. We've nearly hauled in the whole net. Amada, you've worked hard today. What length of net have we hauled in? The net's 150 meters long. Put the fish in the hold. That's not bad at all. The sail isn't folded properly. Wait, I'll help you. 
Life as an Imralgan boy isn't easy. You start young, you're taken out on a boat. To teach you to swim, you're thrown into the water several times. You're made to haul in nets and taught how to maneuver the boat. It's hard work, but one day you finish learning and you can pass your knowledge on to the next generation. Noor is like a father to me. I met him when I was a small boy. He taught me some fishing techniques. And I continue to consult him today because there's still a lot more he can teach me. Who is this young man? It's me, Hamada, the star fisherman. He's still got a lot to learn. Don't throw me in the sea yet. I can't swim. Give me a bit more time. In one day with the Imregen people, Hamada has learned more than in the past few months at New Akshot Port. This arid-looking outpost might just represent a new departure for him. I've been very touched by the warm welcome the Imrigan people have extended to me. They've opened their doors to me and agreed to teach me their skills, which might allow me to make a living. So I'm going to stay here for a while. Why not? It might change the course of my life. The Imrigen people have realized that integrating outsiders into their community is essential to the survival of their traditions. Here, and in the rest of Mauritania, passing on these traditions is the only way for this culture to be kept alive. As you travel inland to the east, the Atlantic coastline gives way to sandy plains and mountain ranges. In the center of the country is the Adrar region, a stony landscape dotted with the odd oasis, providing stopovers for Mauritania's last nomads. Dra's nomadic shepherds cross the desert tirelessly in search of pastures. The goats and dromedaries they breed for meat and milk are their only currency. Yuba is the father of this family. The youngest child is 17-year-old Deda. Go slowly, Deda. The animals have heavy loads. We need to find an easy path for the dromedaries to tread. Yes, okay, father. But which way should I go? Go to the other side of the dune. The kids can stay behind. We'll come back for them once we've set up camp. Dada, don't get separated from us. Wait for your father to tell you which way to go. Okay. In the desert, we use the mountains or the shape of the dunes to find our bearings. Or else we use landmarks passed on to us by word of mouth. I only know where the good pastures are and the watering places because my father has given me a map. But the map isn't written down on paper. It's in my head. It's a mental map that he has made me learn. It's passed down from one generation to another. We've been traveling for a month now, and we're approaching the Tungad oasis. There's water there and also a camel race. I really want to take part and see if I can win it. Mm. 
This is a good spot. That was a long day. Zaha, aren't you tired? When we get to a camp, first we unload the dromedaries, then we find some ground for them to graze on and tie them up. Next we light a fire, put up the tent and start preparing dinner. Careful, father. Don't approach the dromedary from behind, he'll kick you. Tie the dromedaries up quite tight, otherwise they might wander off too far. We've chosen a campsite where the sand is soft enough to hammer in our pegs. Also one which is nicely sheltered from the wind. Hurry up and light the fire. I want my cup of tea. Oh, come on. Do you think Dedar can win the camel race? There will be a lot of competition, you know, but Dedar is an excellent camel driver. He has a good chance of winning. Why not do some divining in the sand to find out? There's no harm in trying. I can see a yellow dromedary, and it's going to overtake Dada. What are you talking about? No! I think Dada is going to come second. You listen to me. My Dada is going to come first, number one. No one can beat him. My son is the best camel driver. No, mother. Dada is going to come second, not first. We'll see about that. We'll see. You've spoiled Dada rotten. You won't even let him ride his dromedaries. Is that what you think? I'm telling you, he could wrestle a dromedary to the ground. Causing a dromedary to drop to the ground by pulling its tail is a way for young nomads like Dada to prove their strength and courage. It's a rite of passage to adulthood that looks a bit like a desert rodeo. Go on, Dada! Catch it! Catch it! Can the women come and assist? That's it! Catch it and hold on tight! Well done, son! That's enough. I'm going to tie it up again. But Dada! Go on, Dada. You can do it. I'm not moving. May Allah grant you a long life. Everyone is waiting. This is a test for you. No, I can't do it. I don't want to. Go on, catch, catch it. it! Catch it! Catch it! Stop! I've had enough. He's had me running in all directions. I must have run 20 kilometers. Once the chores have been done and the evening meal is over, it's time for stories and poems. Poetry sparring matches are one of the oldest nomad traditions. It's a form of mental gymnastics that Yuba and his children indulge in whenever they get the chance. <coughs> Praise be to Allah who presents my eyes with the stunning beauty of my country, Ishiv, Kejet, Tejit and Anwaka. I haven't forgotten the greenness of your pastures in autumn, 
or the sweet scent of the fresh grass that the beasts graze on around our scattered encampments. There is no more beautiful sight than the sky set ablaze on the mountain tops. The north wind pushes the lamb towards its mother. A cup of tea warms the old man's hands. The young gather to exchange the melody of words, poems from yesteryear and today. Oh, the journey to my parents. I've stayed in Atar too long. I will walk for days, weeks, evenings, to be sure of seeing them again. After Atar and Sayatal, my soul is heavy, but I press on. To the end of the night, here is Tamur, where my parents await my return. Popular poetry occupies a big place in our traditions. We try to outdo one another with poems of praise or nostalgia. This is said to be the country of four million poets. The nomadic lifestyle is disappearing in Mauritania. Everyone dreams of moving to the big cities. Our young people are waiting for just one thing, to save up enough money to buy a car so that they can go and shut themselves behind four walls. It's what I see and what I feel. Personally, I like this life. And as long as my parents are alive, I will stay with them. But if one day they are no longer here, I don't know what God will have in store for me. I want to stay in the desert until the day I die. The best moments in life are spent here, beside a log. Tejit, Timinit, Maiden, Agmamin. All these names recited by the nomads in their poetry correspond to places. It's a list of oases that they memorize like a map leading to the one treasure to be found in the desert, water. Tungard is one of the biggest palm grove oases on the Adra Plateau. I can't wait to get to Tungard. We'll be able to buy millet and seeds. We need to stock up. First, we'll give the animals a drink and replenish our water supplies. Fill up the water bottles, fill up the water skins. We need to fill everything up. The next well is a long way away. Did you hear? Fill everything up? Yes. Carrying water is never a burden in the desert. Because if you run out, you suffer. If you finish filling those up, go to the village to sell a sheep. I need money to buy provisions. With its stone houses, interspersed here and there with a few traditional tents, Tungard village has witnessed the gradual settling of Moorish people. Yuba and his family have themselves become semi-nomadic. They follow the rains for several months a year, 
and settle in the summer near to oases, such as this one, so as to be close to the wells. As well as being a place to replenish supplies, oases are also trading posts for nomads. And today, Yuba has gone in search of an old acquaintance, Da Veda, the chief of Tunga. Where have you traveled from? Miles away, a village called Buabul. We've just arrived and I need to buy some food. In exchange, I'm selling this sheep. I'll give you 14,000 for it. Well, that's out of the question. How much will you sell it for me then? Are you kidding me? Tell me how much then. Well, you're no longer my friend. All right, I get it. There. There. And there. I'll take your money. Thank you and goodbye. Daveda, the chief of Tungar, is also a farmer. He owns several hectares of land in the neighboring palm grove. In the shade of the date palms, Da and his men have planted barley and carrots. It's an island of green in the middle of the sand. What I like most in the world is watching the rain fall from the sky. That's the most happiness I can have in life. Because it's rainwater that causes the groundwater to swell. And that water supply allows us to water our plants and keeps the oasis alive. Mohammed Lemon, are you all right up there? The climb's not too difficult. No, it's fine. The palm grove used to extend much further on the other side, but since the desert has advanced, it's grown much smaller. The desert is continually advancing. It's smothering the palm trees and the palm grove is dying. We're trying to find solutions to halt the dunes by planting trees. That has curbed the advance of the desert a bit. I am not the only guardian of this oasis. All the people who work here take up their shovel or their pickaxe to help protect the palm grove. This is the legacy of my ancestors. I don't intend to abandon it. It's the only home I have. By preserving this palm grove, Daveda and the villagers of Tungard are also protecting a watering hole that is indispensable to the survival of nomads on the Adra Plateau. One such tradition is the camel race. This custom, like everything to do with nomadism, is gradually becoming obsolete. Except in Tungard, where Davida has managed to assemble a group of local camel drivers today. There are nine camel drivers on the starting line. Deda is the youngest, but also the lightest. His big brother has also decided to take part. Deda and his brother are well placed. They help one another and zigzag in and out to close the gap on their competitors.
The course is about two kilometers long. By the halfway mark, Dedar has already taken a comfortable lead. All is well, Father. All is well. <laughs> Something wrong? No, everything's fine. A line. It reminds me of the good old days. And of my friends who are no longer with us. The atmosphere, the shouting, all the people who were there. It stirred something in my memory which has been dormant. The camel race used to be a very important event. People would come from all over the Sahara to take part. Things are not what they used to be. Sadly, cars have replaced the dromedaries. I'm very proud of my son. He represents me and he respects me. He came to the desert to keep me company in my final years. I pray to Allah to grant me enough time on this earth to be able to pass all my knowledge on to him. Passing on traditions while there's still time, the race against time is the same all over Mauritania. The Adrar Massif continues to the east, to the edge of the Sahara. There, a geological structure, 50 kilometers in diameter, the result of subterranean volcanic activity and erosion, scans the stars like a giant eye. It's the Richat structure, otherwise known as the Eye of Africa. Nearby are two ancient fortified caravan trading posts, Wadan and Shingeti. Founded in the 13th century, the fortified town of Shingeti was a commercial crossroads between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. This desert metropolis was the seventh holy city of Islam and a symbol of the Sahara's nomadic culture. Shingeti was known for its scholars and was, in its glory years, one of Islam's pillars of knowledge. It is said, that every building housed a library. Today, there are only five libraries left, only three of which are still in use. Saif is one of the last remaining librarians. Did you know that it was distant cousins of our family who introduced tea to Mauritania? People didn't used to drink tea. They infused roots. Herbal tea? Yeah, they drank herbal tea. My grandmother always used to say, I must stop drinking all this tea. But the problem is, as soon as you've washed your face in the morning, you fancy a cup of tea. When it gets to midday, tea is a must. And after lunch, well, if you don't drink tea, it's as if you haven't had lunch. Tea at four o'clock in the middle of the afternoon is another must. And at night you need a cup of tea too. So, of course, she didn't manage to cut down at all. <laughs> Just like every morning, Safe is getting ready to go to work in the family library. 
But today is a special day. His nephew Mohammed is starting work alongside him as a librarian's apprentice. In Mauritania, every tribe has its function. There are warriors and blacksmiths, but we are Zwayas. Zwaya means teacher, someone who carries books. We are here to teach and inform. I want to carry on this tradition and work with manuscripts. Here we are at last. This is the library door. I'll show you how to open it. Look at that. And mind you, don't mistake it for a toothbrush. <laughs> yeah. You have to find a notch inside. Uh, once you find the hole, you jiggle it and... Hey, presto! It opens. I'm not immortal. A young member of the family needs to take over from me. Look at these. Our ancestors kept these manuscripts in trunks or in sacks, sometimes in incredible conditions. These cardboard boxes contain our culture. These manuscripts have all been catalogued. For example, under T, you've got theology, and A is for astrology. It's all been properly indexed. And inside there are treasures to be found, some dating from the 15th century. Here, for example, you've got a summary of the writings of Imam Mustafa Halil. He was a theologian. You need to be extremely careful when you open them. The manuscripts can't withstand the sweat on your hands, or sand, or dust. Look, one part is written in red, and another part in black. The pagination is very unusual. You'll only see that in these works. The last words written here are copied again at the top of the following page. It's a form of pagination. Oh, yes, I see it. Here and here. That's right. Follow me. I'm going to show you some others in broad daylight. This is an astrophysics book, which dates back to the 18th century. The West had scholars too, but the Arabs were the first to explore the sciences of astronomy and mathematics. Here you can already see the constellations for Cancer and Libra. The Arabs knew that the Earth was round and that it revolved long before Galileo and Copernicus. Where did these books come from? How do they all come together? Uh, it depends. Some of these books were written here by members of our family, and some were acquired elsewhere during pilgrimages and business trips. They were bought, exchanged, or given to us out of friendship. And sometimes they contain knowledge that we memorized and then transcribed. That is a skill that has set the inhabitants of Cinquetti apart over the years. Thanks to the conservation efforts of librarians like Saif, the precious manuscripts of Shingeti, the Sorbonne of the desert, have resisted the onslaught of time. But nowadays, it is the libraries themselves which are threatened. All around Shingeti, the desert is advancing, the result of climate change caused by human activity. Adra's old wall towns are gradually becoming submerged in sand. At the request of Saif, Muhammad has gone off to visit the libraries in another ancient town, 130 kilometers from Shingeti. Wadan, a 14th century fortified city, is also listed as a cultural heritage site. Here too, the city is suffering from the ravages of time, desertification and the rural exodus. 
Despite these perils, a group of villagers has sworn not to let Radan and its traditions die. Today, they are preparing for the Festival of Ancient Cities, which will take place in a few months. Hello. Welcome. Saif told me you were coming. Come and join us. It's a traditional game, a sort of leapfrog. When they pass from childhood to adulthood, the young must try to find a place for themselves in society. The weakest will suffer at the hands of the strongest. They will be beaten and jumped over. It's almost a test for them. Why are they touching their heels with their tongues? What does that mean? It's a game of dexterity. You are upside down. You have to go down without touching the others. It's called the fast and the pilgrimage. And that? This game is called the jumping virgins. You need to be very strong to support the weight of the others. If one person collapses, the whole team loses. And when one team loses, there is a debriefing and everyone passes the buck, saying, if you were stronger, we wouldn't have lost. Now it's the tug of war. Are you playing? Yes, I'm going to have a go. Go on then. Go and defend Shingeti's honour. <laughs> It hasn't started yet. Don't stop pulling yet. Go on, Mohammed. Pull on the rope. <laughs> Go on, the man in the blue boo boo. Pull it straight in front of you. Go on, pull. Don't give up. Go on, pull. Don't give up. No, pull harder. Pull harder. It makes me laugh because Mohammed who has traveled a long way to see us, is getting beaten like everyone else. He should take it as a welcoming gesture. It's our way of saying, you are one of us. It's what you might call tough love. It makes me very happy to see a young man like him show an interest in tradition and culture and these manuscripts. I'm comforted by the fact that they won't disappear because the young are there to take responsibility for this heritage, this treasure which has existed since the dawn of time. On his return from Wadam, Muhammad was greeted by Saif. The old librarian wanted to take his apprentice to the big dune which overlooks the surrounding area. Chinguetti must survive. You must pass this knowledge on. My generation of old peoples had its day. It's up to you youngsters to roll up your sleeves now. 
Bear in mind that you are defending the legacy of your forefathers, and that without you, it will soon disappear. It is all down to you, and you alone. Saif is trading up his successor because passing on his expertise is worth more than a legacy of 1,000 pieces of gold. Just like Yuba the nomad, or Nor the fisherman, he knows that Mauritania's heritage now depends on its next generation of sentinels. <laughs>